Okay. So like I said, today's topic is pressure vessels. Pressure vessels refer to a type of structure that we use quite often as an engineer to, uh, to serve a number of purposes. Uh, for example, in the civil engineering profession, we have uh, lots of pipes. I mean, you have them in mechanical as well. Um, so we both deal with pipes. And oftentimes those will be filled with a pressurized liquid. And so that constitutes what we consider a pressure vessel. In particular, we would call that an uncapped pressure vessel. If the pipe is long enough that what's happening at the ends of it aren't affecting the region that we're looking at, we call that an uncapped pressure vessel. We can also have capped pressure vessels, which you might, um, which might more readily come to mind when I use that term. So something like a propane tank um, that appears to be holding some type of fuel. Uh, and then we have whatever's in that, some kind of gas or, or pressurized liquid. So we have, in those pictures on the right, I have three different types of capped vessels. One, kind of in the middle here, is a spherical pressure vessel. The other two are cylindrical. And we're gonna see that the calculations for spherical and cylindrical are related, but slightly different. And then you notice that within the cylindrical pressure vessels, in one case I have a flat end, and in the other case I have a domed end. Thank you. So all of the equations that we're dealing with today pertain to, I'll say kind of this region of our tank. The region kind of in the middle, the region that is not here at this interface between the dome and the cylindrical part. Um, our equations will also apply on the domed part, but just not right in between. So what we're doing today is a little bit too simplistic to tell you what's happening kind of right in between and, and definitely too simplistic to tell you what's happening on this 90 degree corner between your cylindrical tank and your flat end. So those are more, those will have stress concentrations that we don't get into in this class. So just be aware of that. This is not the be all end all of pressure vessel design, but it does give you a basic understanding of how pressure vessels operate and the general stresses that are being observed. So as with everything we do in this class, we need to start by making a number of assumptions. So the first simplifying assumption that we make is that our pressure vessels are what we call thin wall vessels. So thin walled structures. And when I say thin walled, I specifically mean that the ratio of the radius Is that better? There we go. Okay, the radius over the thickness is greater than or equal to 10. And so when I say radius, I mean interior radius. So the inside radius divided by the thickness has to be greater than 10. Practically speaking, the outside radius and the inside radius are going to be almost the same, but just technically speaking, it's the inside radius that I'm referring to. So we want that ratio to be bigger than 10. And as you see, as we go through our calculations, we're gonna find that some of the assumptions we're making are only true if this is true. So because we've made this assumption that we have a fairly thin wall on our pressure vessel, that allows us to assume that the stresses are constant throughout that wall. So what that means is if I have say a cross section that looks like this. The Z direction would be coming out. So you're looking kind of at the cross section of this. The Z direction would be coming out towards you. And I'm saying that, for example, the sigma Z, 
which would be the normal stress in the z direction acting on this is not going to vary with respect to the radius so whether i am on this inside or outside or anywhere in the middle i'm going to have the same magnitude of that stress component my stress components do not vary as a function of the radius The second assumption that we make is that we have uniform pressure applied perpendicular to our interior surface. So that means that I have these pressure arrows all around the interior and I have equal magnitude at any location in terms of the pressure that's being applied. So everything about this geometry and this loading are symmetric. That symmetry implies that we will not have any shear stresses. So because of the symmetry, this object is just being kind of pushed outward, but uniformly all around. So we find that we don't have any of the three stress shear stress components and if we take a small piece of this so let's take that small piece And bring it out here. We have a pressure being applied from the inside. And there's going to be an internal stress as well. And we'll call that sigma r. And then there's going to be these sigma theta components. And then coming out, which you can't see in this case, there may be a sigma z, or a, yeah, sigma z out of the plane. And I say may because it depends on which type of pressure vessel we're dealing with. In the event of an uncapped, there's nothing on the ends of this pressure vessel to provide resistance you know, the gas can just flow out. And so therefore there's nothing to generate stress in that direction. Um, but if you have a stress in the longitudinal direction, it would be you know, coming out of the page looking at us. So now you can see from that picture that on the interior where I've drawn this element, on the interior of this pipe, the radial stress has to equal the applied pressure on the inside. So sigma r equals p on interior surface. And if we were to do the same thing, but look at an element on the exterior of the surface, there would be no applied stress on the exterior. And so then we would end up finding out that sigma r has to equal zero on the exterior surface. And so therefore we can say that sigma r is somewhere between sigma p and zero. But what was my first assumption? That our stresses are the same throughout. So now we have a, a, a stress that we know varies from zero to P, but I also want to assume that my stresses don't vary. So what we do is we make this assumption, which is not true, but serves a purpose for us. We're going to assume that sigma r is equal to zero. Uh, 
So we neglect the effect of sigma r, even though it really does exist, at least on the interior, but it quickly goes to zero over a very short amount of time. Uh, also, I'm going to show you mathematically in just a few slides that sigma r is significantly smaller than the other stress components, provided that we have a thin wall. So that's why the thin wall assumption is very important, because without the thin wall assumption, we can no longer say that this third stress component is negligible. And then when we neglect it, we are no longer representing the true behavior of the material or we're diverging from the true behavior of the material. Any questions up till now? All right. All right, so when we're talking about cylindrical pressure vessels, we have the two types. We have capped and uncapped. So uncapped is typically like a pipe. And we can look at a material element that comes out of an uncapped pipe. Or we can look at, say, a capped pipe. And we can look at that material element. In the case of the uncapped pipe, we will only have one stress component, and that will be our theta stress component. That is the stress that goes around the circumference of the pipe. This is what we refer to as hoop stress or long, or sorry, hoop stress or circumferential stress. Because, like I said, because there's no ends on this cap, there's nothing to for the pressurized liquid to push up against, and therefore there's nothing to generate stresses in that wall in the longitudinal direction. So you can imagine that if this is a long pipe, and, it, and as you come near a bend in that pipe, this assumption may not be true anymore, correct? there now is that bend in the pipe and the pressure is gonna build up against there. So this is only really a simplification that will work kind of in the central region of a long straight pipe. When we have it capped, not only do we have this pressure that is trying to expand, or sorry, the stress that is trying to expand the diameter or the circumference rather, but now we also, develop tension that is in what we call the Z direction, to so the longitudinal direction. And these are always, these are always gonna be tensions. They're always gonna be tensions because what we're doing is we're pressurizing either a gas or a liquid inside of here. And so it's one, it's pushing outward on this pressure vessel. So you're always going to be trying to expand this cross-sectional dimension and trying to extend the length. So you're always going to be getting tension in these two orthogonal directions. You might, not in this class, but in other circumstances of life, you might have what we consider like a reverse pressure vessel where the same concepts apply, except the difference now is that your liquid is outside. So you might have, uh, say, a submarine that is surrounded by ocean water that puts a pressure onto what is, at its essence, a pressure vessel. Or you might have a pipe going through a portion of, say, a gas tank where the, the fuel is around the pipe uh, and it's putting a kind of a compressive pressure now onto that pipe. Yeah. <laughs> That is the normal stress that acts in the circumferential direction. So we're now, instead of using X, Y, Z, we're using a cylindrical coordinate system, which means that um, at any particular point, 
we will have a radial direction, a tangent to the radius, and then a longitudinal direction. And so we're looking at a, just a very small element, in which case theta would be one particular direction. Um, but as you traverse around the cylinder, theta actually changes direction all the time. All right. So we have no shear stresses in any of our pressure vessels. So what does that mean for us? What is important about these normal stresses? They, yes, we, will, we can. We will use these to determine how much pressure we can put in the tank. But what is true when you have an element that has zero shear stress? Yes, the normal stresses that act on it when there is no shear stress are your principal stresses. So that means that sigma theta and sigma z are principal stresses. Exactly, exactly. So if we did a Moore's circle for the theta z direction, you would have sigma one and sigma two represented by these two. And in the case of an uncapped pipe, sigma theta is always going to be your sigma one and your sigma two will then always be zero. So we can Okay, so let's look at deriving the equation that relates the pressure to the circumferential stress, or what we call the hoop stress. So I'm going to take just a slice of the cylinder. So I'm going to take a thin slice that has a unit length of one. And then I'm going to cut it in this direction so that I can then look at what's going to happen on that cross-sectional plane. So I'm, I'm ending up with a half circle with a unit length of one. So this is dimension into the page would be one. And then I have a thickness and a thickness. So this is half of the cross section. And I know that inside I have a pressure applied uniformly throughout. And that pressure is P, little p. And if I make this cut through the cross section and I expose these planes here and here, what stress component do I have acting on those planes? So, I mean, generally speaking, any plane would have a shear or a normal stress or could have a shear or normal stress. But what do we know about pressure vessels or what have we talked about pressure vessels? Yeah, the shear stress will always be zero in the theta z r direction. So when our element has a side that's aligned with any of those three directions, the shear stress will be zero. So there won't actually be a shear component, but what will we have? Yes, our principal stress. So we're gonna have a normal stress and it will be tension. We've already discussed that these will always be tension. And in particular, which normal stress is this? theta, because it's pointing in the direction of the circumference, right? It's perpendicular to the radius at this point, um, and it's not in the longitudinal direction, therefore it has to be the theta direction. Okay. And I'm going to superimpose an xy coordinate system. Even though all of our stresses are in the cylindrical coordinate system, we're gonna do some math on the xy coordinate system and it'll get us where we wanna go.
All right, so. So when we have a uncapped pipes, so this is right now we're dealing with an uncapped. Sigma Z equals zero. Now I need to give one little caveat, unless you apply an axial load. If you pull or push on this thing, then it's going to have an axial load and then it'll have an axial stress and then, you know, then Sigma Z is non-zero. But if you're just pressurizing the liquid, that alone will not generate a Sigma Z value. All right, and we also know that our, our shears are equal to zero, all three of them. And we know that sigma theta is constant. We don't know the value of it, but we know it's constant across that thickness. And so what I think I'll do is I will maybe integrate these pressures and stresses that are acting on this object and sum them to zero. So take an equilibrium equation. Does that sound like a reasonable thing to do? No, I'm gonna integrate the pressure. Um, integrating if it's constant will simplify to multiplication. So, thank you. so let's say we look at the sum of the forces in the y direction because that's the direction that this sigma theta is acting. And remember, we're dealing with a unit width. So I'm gonna multiply all these pressures or integrate these pressures only over the dimension in the X direction. I'm not going to be worrying about the Z direction because that's just equal to one in, in each case. So if I look at the normal stress, as Emma pointed out, we don't necessarily have to integrate it because it's constant, but we do need to multiply it by the width over which it acts. So we have, sigma theta and it's acting over two times the thickness because I have a thickness on the left and a thickness on the right. And then of course there's that one dimension going into the slide to make this really into a force. Um, and I'm going to put a negative sign because this is pointing downward. And now I'm gonna add to that the force from that pressure, which is going to be going upward. But now it's not constant in terms of the Y component. Even though it's a constant pressure, the Y component is changing as we go along the surface. So we're going to integrate over that surface. So I'm gonna integrate from zero to pi. Now the question is, what am I integrating? I want the Y, component of that pressure, correct? So how do I get a Y component? Sine? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do P sine theta. That should give me the Y component. So this is gonna project to the Y direction. And now the area that it's acting over is going to be a, a incremental arc length. And then of course times a one into the page, which we'll omit that part. But that means we're multiplying this by R D theta. And that then should equal zero. So P is a constant value, R is a constant value. So we're really integrating sine of theta from zero to pi, which coincidentally turns out to be a very nice number. Anyone want to know what that number is? Close, it's two. So this ends up being two times P times R. <clears throat> 
from there, I can solve for sigma theta. And we find that sigma theta is PR over T. So this is formula you're going to want to box and keep close. What it tells us is that the stress in the circumferential direction, also known as the hoop stress, is calculated as the applied pressure, so the internal pressure, multiplied by the internal radius. So remember, we're integrating this, this pressure over the surface, and so R is that internal radius, because the surface that the pressure is acting on is the internal surface. So it's the pressure times the radius divided by the thickness. And that tells you how much stress you have in that direction. Uh, another way, in case you want another way to, to look at this, looking at this right-hand term here, this part, if you would like, you can think of that as pulling out that P, because P is a constant. And then you can think of it as the integral of zero to pi of sine r d theta, where now that this integral, this integral here, then represents the projected area. So projected area meaning this area here. So you can either think of it as you're manipulating P to get the Y component of P and then actually applying that over the arced area. Or you can manipulate that arced area to get the projected surface and then multiply P times that. Either way, mathematically, you get the same answer. Yes? Is this missing a theta or is it a sine of Oh, yes, it's missing a theta. sine theta, r d theta. Okay. All right, so the second stress is the longitudinal stress. Now to, to calculate the longitudinal stress, we're going to have to look at a capped pressure vessel. That's the only way that we can generate that component. So now what I wanna do is I want you to imagine that we are taking a slice of this pressure vessel right near the end, and then we're pulling that end off, and we're gonna look at the pressures that are acting on that cap, and then the internal stresses that are going to be in that wall pulling back to keep the cap in place, right? Because in order, the, the gas is wanting to push that cap off, and then the cap is held in place by this cylindrical portion of the tank, and that's how we generate that stress component. So we can draw the, kind of draw the free body diagram of that. So we have these capped ends, and then we separate them from, say, the cylindrical portion of the body. There's pressure acting equally throughout, and that pressure also acts on these capped ends. And then we have our internal stresses. And if we were to look at, say that end head on, oops, not want that color. What you'd see is that the pressure inside the tank, it was pushing on that end uniformly. And then we have the longitudinal stress that is acting in a circular pattern where the walls attached to the end, coming back out at us. So the longitudinal direction of this is Z. 
So now when we take the sum of our forces, we're wanting to take the sum of the forces in the z direction and equate them to zero. In the case of this flat cap, the pressure is um, a little bit more easy to see what the equation for that is going to be. The force generated by that pressure is going to be the pressure multiplied by the area over which it acts. That would be pi r squared. Now that r is once again the interior radius, right? The pressure is only capable of acting on the interior of the tank. So if it's a flat cap, does this formula make sense to you? Yeah? OK. Uh, so what if I told, yeah? Are we assuming that all these tanks are like completely full? Or Yes. Yes. So it's it's a yes. It's a uniform pressure coming from the um, whatever's inside of it. So yes. As you can imagine, the other answer to that question then opens up more complex analysis that we don't feel like doing here. Uh, but you may see elsewhere in mechanical engineering. All right. Uh, so what if I told you this was a domed end? Do you think that changes the equation? Right. So, so now you have to get the component of the pressure that is in the z direction, because that pressure is going to be oriented all along that dome. You have to get the component that's in that z direction and then integrate that over the dome. Or you saw mathematically when we were dealing with this half circle, mathematically that process of getting the y component of p and then integrating over the dome was the same as just multiplying p times the projected area that it would act on. And what you would find if you go through this mathematical process is you can do the same thing in three dimensions. You can do the same thing with a dome. That if you take the projected area of that dome, which is pi r squared, and multiply it times the pressure, mathematically that's the same as getting that z component of that pressure and integrating it over the dome. So even though the way that you kind of mentally go through this process is different for the two, the end result is the same mathematically. So it doesn't matter whether you have domed or capped ends in terms of the pressure that you would get in your walls. So the end itself will behave differently, right? This flat end is gonna behave differently than a domed end, but in terms of the stress that we're generating in our walls, it's going to be the same. So we have PR over 2T. No, I didn't. Never mind. Spoiler alert. Shucks. Okay. Um, P, <laughs> P times pi R squared. That's where we are. So that's going in one direction. In the other direction, we have the stress in the Z direction that's holding it back on. And that has to be multiplied by the area over which it occurs in order for this to in order for this to uh, become a force. So we will calculate that as two pi r times the thickness, where once again, r is the interior and t is the thickness. So if you wanted to be perhaps slightly more exact, you could say two pi outside radius minus two pi inside radius, or you could say maybe two pi times the average radius and then multiply it by the thickness. But none of that really matters if we keep this small thickness assumption, that our thickness is small relative to our radius. In that case, uh, the difference between our two radii is very small and, and this works well. And we say that's equal to zero. Okay, so then we can solve for sigma z. 
And now we see that sigma z ends up being equal to pr over 2t. So that's what I just said earlier. So these two equations are very similar. Because remember, sigma theta was pr over t. So in fact, your z direction stress is half that of your hoop stress. So if I had a pressurized liquid in here, I would have a stress going around the circumference, and then I would have a stress in this longitudinal direction that was half the stress that went around the circumference. So what that means in terms of your materials is if your material is homogeneous and has the same, say, tensile capacity in any direction, which direction would you expect a crack to occur? The stress that's in the circumferential direction would cause the fracture? Is that what you're saying? Or you're saying the crack would be circumferential? The stress that goes around the circumference is always going to be bigger, so it's going to reach that failure stress first. But what that means is that the crack will actually be a longitudinal crack. And you may have seen pipes. If pipes blow out, it's usually always along the length of the pipe. It's not typically this direction because it's a tensile failure and it's caused by that hoop stress, which reaches its ultimate or you know, whatever fracture stress it's going to have. And that gives you that crack along that length. So, all right, so one of my favorite things to do is to always go back to more circle. So thank you for bringing that up earlier. So we have, I really need another slide. I'm gonna, that. 